Good morning, everybody. This is Tony Dang, Executive Director with California Walks, uh, and I wanted to uh, welcome you all to today's webinar on the Active Transportation Program. Uh, today, I'll be joined by my colleague, Linda Kamushian, the Senior Policy Advocate with the California Bicycle Coalition, uh, and the two of us are here representing the Active Transportation Resource Team, which is a collaboration between the Rails to Trails Conservancy, California Walks, the California Bicycle Coalition, and the local government commission. And as a team, we uh, are working uh, across the state to provide technical assistance to uh, disadvantaged communities uh, with a focus on Riverside and Tulare counties. Uh, so today, uh, we'll be going over some uh, major changes uh, in this uh, next uh, round of funding for the active transportation program. And with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Linda, who will be uh, walking us through today's agenda. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're really excited to be able to get uh, just on this conversation. We've been involved with the development of, of the, the draft guidelines and the applications, and we're excited to, to roll out the updates and get everyone uh, up and ready for applications. So today we'll be talking about just a general overview about the active transportation program, uh, a bit of history, and go into cycle four uh, timeline, so what to expect and when. Uh, key changes to the ATP guidelines is, is going to be the bulk of our conversation um, and, and the, the application types and the overview. And we'll talk a little bit about lessons learned from previous cycles. And we have a list of resources to help you as you prepare your applications. And uh, we want to spend a good amount of time at the end to, to take your questions. Feel free to uh, send your questions into the, the question box and, and that you have um, and also feel free to email us any questions and we'll try and get to those as well. All right, let's get started. All right, so uh, I'm going to dive right into an overview of the active transportation program uh, just to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Uh, to those of you who have been uh, deeply involved uh, in ATP since its inception, welcome back. Uh, and to those of you who are new to all this, uh, welcome to the madness. Um, so uh, the active transportation program is uh, California's uh, sole source of dedicated funding for uh, investments in walking, uh, biking, trails, and safe routes to school programs. Uh, currently, it's funded at roughly $223 million annually. Uh, and the call for projects uh, happens every even numbered year uh, with this current round of funding, um, otherwise known as a cycle of funding, uh, cycle four, is uh, slated to open this spring. So what types of projects are um, accepted in the active transportation program. Uh, we generally categorize it along three different lines. One is infrastructure projects. So that can encompass anything from new or improved bikeways or walkways to different types of uh, safe routes to school improvements to make it easier for kids to walk and bike to school or safe routes to transit projects to make it easier for folks to walk and bike to a transit stop or station. Uh, bike parking uh, and recreational trails or trailheads that improve connections to non-motorized corridors. Uh, the second big category is non-infrastructure. So that is uh, any sort of educational encouragement, uh, evaluation or enforcement program. Uh, this also includes uh, temporary demonstration style events uh, or pop-up events. Uh, and I should note that in addition to infrastructure and non-infrastructure, uh, you are uh, allowed to um, submit a what's called a combined project, so uh, a project that includes both an infrastructure component and a non-infrastructure component. And in fact, that's uh, the type of approach that, that we have seen be very successful in past cycles, and it's something that we encourage applicants to do. Uh, the last uh, type of project that is accepted in uh, this program uh, are for plans. And so these are for community-wide uh, pedestrian, bicycle uh, master plans, or safe routes to school master plans, or uh, a combined active transportation plan. Uh, one thing to note here is that um, these plans really should be uh, in or serving a, a predominantly disadvantaged community. And, and the thinking behind that is uh, we want to make sure that uh, communities with 
uh, few or little resources um, uh, are able to, to access this program because uh, eventually in the future, uh, the program uh, might um, make uh, having a plan and having projects identified within a plan a requirement for all project types. But that's not uh, the case right now, and we want to spend the time uh, making those investments to make sure that all communities um, have robust uh, planning efforts and prioritize project lists at the local level. So who can apply? Um, uh, generally, it's uh, local, regional, and state agencies, um, transit agencies, uh, public schools and school districts are eligible to apply, uh, and tr uh, federally recognized tribal governments are allowed to apply. Uh, one thing to note with all of this is that uh, the, the big determining factor uh, with who can apply is whether or not uh, the entity can enter into a master agreement with Caltrans. And uh, entering into a master agreement with Caltrans is a very uh, lengthy and time-consuming process. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, it, it's a lengthy process, and so um, if your uh, if the entity who's proposing an application doesn't have a master agreement in place um, already, it's it's likely pretty difficult to get one uh, set up in time uh, for this cycle. So uh, if if you are uh, currently a, an entity that doesn't have a master agreement, or uh, you're a, a nonprofit uh, or other sort of organization that's looking to to promote a project, really uh, make sure that the uh, local agency or regional agency that you're uh, collaborating with has that master agreement in place. Uh, so I wanted to go over a little bit uh, over the uh, statutory goals of the program. The program has five main statutory goals. The first being uh, increasing walking and biking for transportation. Uh, give me one second. Uh, Hey, Linda, can you hear me? I'm getting some questions saying people have uh, trouble with audio. Uh, I see that too. Uh, so if you're having trouble with audio, it might be that you, you it might be your computer um, or it could be that you can call in. There's a phone line. I'm hearing things clearly on this end, uh, but we'll see how we'll, we'll, we'll be doing as we go through if, if yeah. I hear other comments says sounds fine here just fine so it might just be uh, okay. your device so you can also call in there's a call in number with your registration email that you can um, use and the audio should be clearer on that too. Okay. Uh, so back to the statutory goals of the program, uh, that first one uh, is uh, increasing walking and biking for transportation. Uh, so the second statutory goal of the program is to improve the safety of people walking and biking. Uh, here in, in California, um, currently over one in four traffic fatalities involve somebody walking and biking. And so we know that um, pedestrian safety and bicycle safety is a very uh, large issue in California. And, and that's why it's one of the statutory goals of this program. Uh, another goal of the program is to reduce vehicle use and greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the next goal of the program is to enhance public health and uh, reduce childhood obesity. And the last goal of the program is to ensure benefits to disadvantaged communities. So um, the, the thinking behind uh, that statutory goal is that um, for a lot of disadvantaged communities, they have been faced with decades of disinvestment and so um, uh, and, and particularly in the transportation arena and so this program uh, is really trying to proactively address um, that historical uh, disinvestment in those communities. So uh, one interesting thing about uh, this program is that it splits uh, into three different competitions. And so 50% uh, of the funding in the program is uh, administered by the California Transportation Commission in a statewide competition. 40% uh, is administered by uh, the large uh, metropolitan planning organizations in the state uh, in, a, in regional competitions for uh, communities uh, in their jurisdiction. And I'll go over which MPOs those are. Uh, and then lastly, for uh, communities that don't fall within a, a large uh, metropolitan planning organization, uh, those communities are eligible to to also compete in the small urban and rural competition, uh, which is also administered by the California Transportation Commission. Um, 
One thing to note here is that the program does what's called um, sequential project selection. So um, applicants to the program uh, should be submitting to the statewide competition for a first attempt at securing funding. Uh, then any unfunded uh, application in the statewide competition uh, gets kicked down to the re regional competitions or to the small urban and rural competition for a second chance at getting funding. So here are the uh, MPOs that receive uh, funding to run regional competitions. So they cover uh, our largest uh, metropolitan areas in the state. So that's the Bay Area, uh, so, and that competition is run by the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. Uh, then Southern California run by SCAG, uh, San Diego run by SANDAG. Uh, Sacramento area run by SACOG, and then we have um, five uh, MPOs in the, uh, the Central Valley that also run regional competitions uh, in Fresno, Kern, San Joaquin, Stanislaus, and Tulare. Um, one thing uh, to note here is that uh, the regional competitions may have uh, additional uh, rules or different questions from the statewide competitions. So uh, if you're interested in making sure that your application is competitive for both the statewide and regional competition, uh, we really advise you to uh, check in with your MPO uh, to, to see if they have already started uh, their guidelines uh, development process for their regional competition uh, and or um, their supplemental questions for their regional applications. Uh, a Tony little bit about... Uh, uh, to add, yep. Sorry, like Tahoe uh, COG is also part of this round. Thanks, Victoria, for... Oh, adding. thanks. I always forget about them because they split state lines. <laughs> Okay, uh, going into the current ATP funding sources. So uh, the ATP is funded um, through a, a mix of state and federal funding sources. So um, it's funded through the state highway account. So for those of you who have been in this a long time, uh, those funds are comprised of uh, what was formerly the bicycle transportation account and the state's um, Safe Routes to School program. Uh, then there is some federal funding. So um, this uh, transportation alternatives program that has been renamed to something monstrous that I don't even want to attempt to say, um, but that is now, uh, that is still in the program, uh, as well as a, a small piece of the federal recreational trails program. Uh, then there are other federal uh, funds uh, that uh, support the program. And then uh, most recently uh, there, uh, has been some additional funding um, put into the program by the Road Maintenance and Rehabilitation Account, or SB1. And so uh, just uh, so, so everyone can kind of see uh, the impact of SB1, so Cycle 3 uh, programmed about $264 million, uh, and for Cycle 4, uh, we have $446 million to, to program uh, in all of the components. Uh, one thing to note here is that uh, $100 million uh, in fiscal years 21, 22, and 22, 23 are, are being held in, in reserve uh, for uh, ATP Cycle 5, uh, and I will uh, get into uh, why that was um, done uh, later when we talk about guidelines changes. Um, and just to put that all into perspective, this is a, a little graph I put together um, showing uh, the available amounts of funding in each of the um, program cycles, as well as the uh, requested funding amounts in each of the cycles. So as you can see, um, uh, you know, cycle four has a nice uptick in funding, uh, but it still kind of pales in comparison to uh, the amount of funding that's that has been historically requested. And uh, I'm anticipating that we'll likely see a, a lot of um, uh, requests for funding this cycle as well. So just know that this is a very competitive program and uh, you all are, are doing a good job by um, showing up early in the process to, to learn about the guidelines changes and uh, application changes now so that you can be prepared to submit a competitive application. Uh, in terms of timeline, I'm just going to go over a very uh, uh, a brief timeline, uh, and I should note that um, you can look at page two of the uh, ATP guidelines for the, the full timeline. But uh, we're anticipating that the uh, guidelines uh, are adopted on May 16th. Uh, currently, they're in final draft format, and they will be presented at the 
uh, a CTC meeting, I believe next week um, for a CTC review. Um, then uh, after the guidelines are adopted, uh, the state call for projects will be opening uh, and uh, folks will have until July 31st to submit their application to um, the state uh, co competition. Uh, one thing to note here is that uh, all of the regional competitions have different uh, deadlines and timelines that may or may not align with the state uh, timeline. So please, again, uh, consult with your uh, MPO and their, uh, their websites and their guidelines for uh, those dates. Uh, and then uh, lastly, uh, at the end of this year, on December 31st, we're anticipating uh, CTC to uh, uh, issue their staff recommendations for the statewide competition and the small urban and rural competition. So uh, in terms of uh, some of the key guidelines changes we wanted to go over, um, the first one I wanted to go over was uh, the fact that we are now switching to a four-year programming cycle. Um, so what that means is that uh, program applicants will now have uh, four full years to uh, to complete a project, as opposed to in cycles one through three, uh, folks had between uh, two to three years to complete a project. So uh, we're hoping that that will um, help folks uh, better plan and deliver projects. Uh, and part of why we've kept uh, the 100 uh, million in reserve for fiscal years 21, 22, and 22 um, 23 is uh, to allow for cycle five to also be a fully uh, funded four-year programming cycle. Uh, I should note that um, for cycle four, uh, uh, funding will be available for uh, four fiscal years. So that'll be starting fiscal year 1920 and running through fiscal year 2223. And Great. I will turn and it to Linda. Sure. And so this year, you'll notice uh, when you look through the guidelines that there is language uh, specifically calling out transformative projects and that the commission is encouraging applicants to uh, provide a transformative benefit to their community or region for the projects that you're applying for. And it's specifically laid out as, uh, as general and broad, but there is some detail within some of the applications that we'll review uh, a little bit later. But the, the intention behind the conversation and, and, and what, what this has, uh, how this has unfolded through the, the development of the applications and the drafts is that we really want to be able to uh, use this funding to, to create big changes in your communities and, and be able to get people biking and walking uh, faster and, and a, with a bigger investment. So the, the piece of this, this project language is to say, how can we make a bigger investment? What kind of transfer transformation can happen? And it's not just size, it's not just the size of investment, but it's also the quality. So really looking at, um, even if it's a smaller uh, investment, but what are the, can you get a really lot, a, a big benefit out of putting in protected bike lanes instead of just a, a class two bike lane? So looking at the quality of your projects and also uh, maybe the size and the, the level investment thinking about how to, to create the networks um, that could really get people to use the facilities in a, in a way. The, the next big uh, change to the guidelines is uh, related to non-infrastructure um, programs. So there is language in uh, the guidelines uh, kind of uh, further defining uh, what startup non-infrastructure means. And so uh, the commission has stated that it's their intent uh, that they want to fund uh, newer non-infrastructure programs. So in communities that have never had any sort of non-infrastructure program or uh, non-infrastructure programs that incorporate uh, new sorts of elements or are expanding um, on the, the sort of non-infrastructure program work that they have been doing. And uh, Linda will be diving uh, more into that language when we go over the non-infrastructure application itself. Uh, the next uh, change to the guidelines, and, and these are um, some minor uh, changes to the definitions related to disadvantaged communities. Uh, so um, 
Uh, the minor changes are just um, minor updates or well, I guess I should step back. For, for those of you who are new to the active transportation program, uh, there are a number of ways to qualify as um, a disadvantaged community in the program. Uh, the first option is uh, to use the median household income metric from the American Community Survey or the census. Um, so for this cycle, we're using the 2012 to 16 American uh, Community Survey data. So that means that if your community, uh, uh, your census tract um, makes less than 50, about $51,000 a year, uh, that census tract qualifies as a disadvantaged community. Uh, the second um, option is to use the Kalen Virus Screen 3.0. So Kalen Virus Screen is a tool that was developed by um, Cal EPA to help identify uh, disadvantaged communities for the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. Uh, and so in the ATP, um, you are considered a disadvantaged community under this metric if you are within the top 25% of Cal and Bioscreen. So that means that if your census tract that, that your project is serving has a score that is greater than or equal to 39.34. Um, the third uh, metric that uh, you can use to qualify as a disadvantaged community applies to safe routes to school programs uh, and projects. So um, the metric there is um, participation rates in the uh, free or reduced uh, meal program. Uh, and uh, you qualify as disadvantaged if uh, your school has greater than a 75% participation rate in that program. Um, uh, uh, holdovers from the last cycle for disadvantaged uh, al alternative disadvantaged communities definitions include all federally recognized tribes. Um, they are um, just considered disadvantaged communities for the purposes of this program. Uh, and then small communities that feel like the official data sources um, aren't accurately reflecting um, their income levels. Um, for those communities, you are able to uh, conduct and submit a quantitative assessment uh, that documents how you meet the, uh, the income criteria. Uh, the last uh, available uh, option for disadvantaged communities is um, facing a little bit of a change, um, but it is a, uh, the option for uh, a regional definition. And so uh, these regional definitions have to be uh, an official adopted definition of disadvantaged communities in a regional transportation plan. Uh, and that definition has to go, has to have gone through a robust public participation process. Uh, now, the one caveat with the regional definitions this cycle is that um, the regional uh, transportation planning agencies must, uh, and uh, metropolitan planning organizations must submit uh, their regional definitions to uh, the California Transportation Commission by June 1st uh, in order to be considered. And then California Transportation Commission and staff will be reviewing these proposed regional definitions uh, and getting back to folks about whether or not um, they will be accepting uh, those proposed regional definitions uh, as uh, qualifiers for the disadvantaged communities um, a portion of the program. The next major change uh, that you'll see between last year's application and this year's different applications is that the public health question in the past that was a standalone question asking about sort of the, the public health engagement and environment and the local health issues uh, and how the project is addressing those issues is now folded into the statement of needs question within each of the applications. Um, what this means is that, you know, the, the commission is looking for uh, how are you how are you address? How are you taking into the local public health concerns, uh, taking them into consideration, looking at health disparity, uh, connecting with the local health departments, understanding that your project has a place in supporting the health and well-being of of the community that you're trying to reach. And so, are you taking a, a deep dive into the the health data that's available um, for your area? And the applications actually, uh, and we'll speak to this a little bit further, but uh, it provides some suggestions on where to look for that. Uh, not really looking at state and national data. In the past, um, we've noticed that applicants sort of use very general uh, data when it comes to this question. So really, the, the question is trying to understand the, the local needs uh, for um, walking and biking in relationship to public health. 
And then um, the last major change, which is probably the most significant change, um, is uh, that there will now be different application types, a total of five different application types, depending on what you are applying for. So um, part of the rationale behind this move um, was particularly for um, planning applications and non-infrastructure applications uh, in past cycles all um, these different project types had to fill out the same application. And so, um, you know, we got some very, we, we did not get the, the most useful information from, you know, planning applications or non-infrastructure applications because the applications uh, themselves were very geared towards infrastructure projects. So with this cycle, there will be um, separate applications uh, uh, for planning type projects, separate applications that are for non-infrastructure projects. Uh, and then for infrastructure um, style projects, um, there was the decision made to um, have different application types depending on the uh, total project cost of the of the project, um, and the idea behind that is is that um, uh, the California Transportation Commission felt that it was uh, unfair to ask uh, the same amount of information from a project requesting five hundred thousand dollars as opposed to a project that's requesting like ten million dollars, and so um, as we walk through the uh, infrastructure applications, you'll kind of see that uh, the larger your project is, the more uh, information and additional questions uh, you'll be asked to answer. Um, now, with all of that said, we did want to point you to the California Transportation Commission's website uh, here on the screen uh, because, you know, the guidelines are still in draft form and the applications are still in draft form. So uh, please, we encourage you to uh, visit this website uh, in the uh, coming months to uh, get the most up-to-date information from the California Transportation Commission. And so actually, if, if you wanted to open up that link, I, I added it in the chat box because um, it, it might be helpful for you to visually look at the different applications as we move through. We're going to be doing more of an overview of the major changes of each uh, application and as it relates to that project. But if you know, you're a visual learner like me, I love to see things as I go through. So this, this is where you would find the link to the applications that we're speaking about today. So the first thing we want to talk to you about is the plan application. And this is uh, really for, uh, for the development of a community-wide bicycle, pedestrian, safe routes to school, or active transportation plan. And it's, it's going to be predominantly based in a, in a disadvantaged community. And up to 2% of statewide competitive funding and small urban rural funding is dedicated uh, two plans and in the large MPOs uh, they can set aside also up to 2% of the funding uh, and this this plan application also has an appendix a that of the guidelines the the ATP guidelines at the end of the guidelines you'll see a guidance for the plans and it lists out components that have to be included included in uh, your application or for the plan uh, and if for some reason it can't be included, then you have to, to, to say why. And so, uh, so just going into uh, the different questions that the plan will be asking, we've laid it out, uh, the, the, the five applications uh, for you to see just how uh, the points break down. There's 100 points possible for each of the, the applications. This is how the draft applications are set now. Uh, and, and the green highlights the question that uh, you know, you've seen in the past. It, there's been some minor tweaks here and there. And then the orange is completely new to the, the application for that particular project. And so for the plan application, it's really just addressing four major areas. Uh, first, you need to be demonstrating uh, where that where the plan is going to be and if it's in a disadvantaged community. And it's right now set to 30 points. So this is really the, the weight of, of um, uh, the, m most of the points of this plan, uh, although there's a good split between the others too. So again, you're looking at how to identify the, the community and, 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 and tracking what, what you're going to use um, and, and how it's going to benefit, um, benefit that community. So, then the, the next question 
that is new is giving priority to new plants. So uh, it's the, the commission is looking to see if uh, ATP funds can be allocated for plans that are uh, where a community does not have a plan or doesn't have a bicycle pedestrian plan. And if they only have one, then there's more points for that as well. So um, something to note in all of these is that the commission will also have a rubric uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll mention this at the end as well, is that with the rubric and the application, you'll be able to see how the points are allocated and what you want to be aiming for. So, um, so again, priority for new plans um, versus ones that are being updated. And in the statement of need uh, for the plan, uh, this is where we see, um, you know, similar to what has been in the past as far as uh, describing the need, but here we see that we want to understand where is, where is there insufficient uh, infrastructure, uh, looking at some of the, the safety issues, the lack of connectivity, and again, the public health uh, concern, and how you can fold that into your uh, narrative. And then uh, public participation in planning is very much um, similar to what it's been in the past. Uh, not a lot to, to dive into there. Uh, um, basically, you need to be demonstrating that you're engaging with those that are going to be affected by the plan. Um, those who are affected by the plan are involved in the process and uh, are, are uh, involved throughout the process. And, and especially because this is for a disadvantaged community or geared towards disadvantaged communities, uh, how are they being involved is really demonstrating how that it happens is really key to getting the points here. Uh, and lastly, the, the implementation uh, and, and plan development. This is also a new question for this area. Uh, you're looking at how is, you know, you're prioritizing, you want to be prioritizing projects that can uh, actually, you know, be implemented soon after the plan is, is done and identifying any funding sources uh, other than the ATP that then would be available for that. So uh, part of this application is also completing the 22 plan, which is uh, basically a scope of work identifying what I just mentioned is, is those projects and, and how the plan is being developed and uh, more along the lines of being able to take your narrative and make it into something that can be counted for. Uh, if you, for some reason, you know, if you're on this call and you're not a jurisdiction uh, or an agency and you don't know if your community has a bike or ped plan, you can go to uh, CalBikes website. We have an inventory, uh, and uh, maybe that can lead you to having that conversation with your um, local agency of whether or not this is a, a good project for your community to take on. Next, we'll go into non-infrastructure application. Uh, this is uh, projects eligible for this are education, encouragement, and enforcement activities that further the goals of the ATP. Um, so uh, oftentimes safe routes to school programs um, uh, and this can is in one of the changes here this year is um, the, what Tony had mentioned earlier that it, that focusing on startup programs or prioritizing startup programs where there haven't been before uh, or expanding or adding new components to existing programs, but this funding would not fund existing or ongoing program operations. So you have to demonstrate that either it's a new program entirely or it's an expand, expansion of one that exists. Uh, and the other key component of the non-infrastructure application is that you do have to demonstrate sustainability. Commission is looking for uh, you know, uh, applicants to be able to carry forward the program and not just make it a, a one-time experience. So again, uh, a, a point breakdown of what's, what's you know, the same and new. We're looking at um, benefits to disadvantaged communities. So this is back to the, the 10 points uh, across the rest of the application. Um, you know, demonstrating again where where the project is or and where the program is and uh, who it's reaching. And uh, then you're looking at the statement of need here is a, a major part of the application. So this is where you want to spend a good amount of your time thinking about 
why this project is needed, why this program is needed, and who it's reaching, uh, and what are the, some of the issues that we're trying to address. And so part of the statement of, of uh, need here that we'll see is um, benefits to disadvantage, um, I, I'm sorry, uh, uh, looking at, again, the, the, the different elements of, of what a, a, a issue statement or a need statement would be. So, um, you know, why that program is needed in that area. Then we're looking at, um, then across the rest of the applications, you, there's the safety, uh, de demonstrating a safety component. So um, what's the, the crash history? Again, this is similar to years past. Um, what's, uh, you know, have there been collisions? Uh, and, you know, applicants are encouraged to use UC Berkeley's Safe Trek TIMS tool, uh, which is, uh, you can find, you know, um, links to get there through the application process. Uh, and basically this helps you, they, the uh, UC Berkeley has helped to develop um, a, a specifically, um, you know, a tool designed specific, specifically for the ATP. So, uh, you know, you, you create a, uh, uh, you create a um, account and then it, you know, you, you bring together your different pieces. So unfortunately we won't have time to go into the demonstration of that, but I, I encourage you to take a look at that site to get familiar with with what that is. Um, basically, you'll be creating a heat map. Um, and in general, you need to be demonstrating in the safety piece, uh, you know, where where the, the collisions or the challenges are, maybe if there's fatalities and injuries, that's where you would demonstrate it. Public participation and planning uh, is still um, similar in non-infrastructure piece. You know, you're, you're wanting to describe how the, your target audience has been uh, engage in the program and how the different stakeholders were able to incorporate their ideas into the program proposal uh, and how they'll be continued to be engaged um, once the plan has, in, has been implemented. So additional uh, changes here now. Um, one is the evaluation and sustainability piece. This is where we mentioned in the guidelines. We really want to see um, from these from these applications, uh, the, the effect if how the effectiveness of the program will be measured. What what are you going to use um, as your sort of uh, you know markers of success, uh, and what tools are you going to use in order to do that? Then uh, again, how is your your program going to be sustained after completion? Next level would be uh, innovation program elements. This is thinking about are you bringing uh, a new non-infrastructure idea or program to your area? Uh, are you utilizing best practices, recognized best practices that have proven to be successful in similar, you know, areas that are close to your context? Uh, you know, this is a chance for you to, to describe why you chose your specific um, elements that you are adding to your program. Looking at program scope and implementation, this is uh, an additional form to um, similar to the plan uh, application where there's a 22 plan form. Uh, this has a 22 R form that has to be completed. And basically it's the scope of work uh, form to uh, let, the, let the commission know what activities you're planning to have and how many you intend to, uh, how many people you intend to reach and, and the likes of that. The next, uh, going into the infrastructure application. So there's three infrastructure applications that was mentioned. This is the uh, 1.5 million and less. Um, you know, uh, we're looking at, again, the benefits to disadvantaged communities uh, question, similar to other questions, looking at how you can uh, identify your community. Uh, and then, the statement of need here, as you can see, it's 53 points. It's very weighty in this application. You really need to demonstrate, uh, you know, why you are putting, you know, what's happening here. What, what is, what is the context? Uh, why is this spe specific program or, or project rather needed here? And, uh, and part of the part of the reason that this is a a, a heftier discussion is that our heftier points it, is that not only are you describing your, your needs, but you're also uh, discussing what the proposed project will do in terms of 
closing gaps or creating new routes. Uh, this is where you'll be providing a map. You have to provide a map. And uh, again, describing the, the needs in terms of public health is now centered here in this question. Uh, similar to question before, there's safety component, but in the, in the infrastructure applications, you do have to describe safety countermeasures. So when you describe your issue in part A, how then are you, uh, what is it that you're using to then uh, counter those, those issues? Uh, and so uh, what specific infrastructure components and pieces, um, or, or what are the, the outcomes that would happen because of your uh, uh, infrastructure project? Uh, then public participation and planning, uh, we see here similar to before, again, you know, who was part of the process, um, you know, what, what do you have intended for uh, people being involved now and, and afterwards, how will they continue to be engaged? And lastly, part of this, uh, this piece is a, a scope and um, plan consistency. Often we see that applicants uh, describe one scenario, but they're not really consistently showing what, how they're going to address it. So this is just a, a two points, although not very many points, but still enough to um, here to check off your box to make sure that things are consistent across the board. Okay, um, so this is Tony again. I'll be diving into the medium and large infrastructure applications. Uh, and mainly I'll be focusing in on the areas where it differs from the small infrastructure application. And then there are some completely new questions to both the program uh, that are only applicable to the medium and large infrastructure applications. So um, here's the scoring breakdown. So first uh, we start off with um, uh, benefiting disadvantaged communities. So again, uh, uh, like the small infrastructure projects, you're asked to uh, identify uh, the specific uh, census tracts uh, that your project is impacting. And uh, like the small infrastructure uh, application, you're required to uh, identify how your project closes the gap or provides a connection or addresses some sort of def uh, active transportation deficiency uh, that meets uh, an important need of the disadvantaged community. Uh, now, beyond that, uh, medium infrastructure applications uh, must also explain how the disadvantaged community residents will have physical access to the project and medium infrastructure project applications will also be asked to illustrate um, and or provide documentation for how the proposed project was requested by or supported by disadvantaged community residents. Um, I will say that this section will be evaluated on how well an applicant really articulates uh, how the, the project uh, provides a direct benefit to disadvantaged communities, whether the project, project is located uh, within a disadvantaged community and whether the project is located within or provides a direct benefit to a severely disadvantaged community. So um, I, I believe in all of the application types, there, there is um, uh, a set number of points set aside for severely disadvantaged communities. So I believe that's defined as um, communities less than or equal to 60% of the statewide median household income. Uh, and so that will just be automatically calculated in all the applications based off of the uh, census information that you're providing. Uh, now, moving on to the statement of need, uh, it's worth 43 points in the medium infrastructure application. So um, as Linda mentioned, uh, in, in this section, you're asked to provide current count data and methodologies for how the data was collected. Um, however, th this section is not, that, that part of the section is not scored. Um, then there are uh, really two uh, main components to uh, the statement of need that really allow an applicant to narrative, narratively describe how the community um, or to describe the community's need for the proposed project. So applicants are asked to describe uh, the issues the project will address and how the project will benefit non-motorized users. Um, and then applicants are asked to describe how the proposed project best addresses the need outlined uh, that, that they just outlined. 
Now, uh, moving on to the safety section, uh, as with the small infrastructure projects, the medium infrastructure applications are uh, asked to describe the project locations, bicycle and pedestrian collision history, and to provide that supporting data. Uh, applicants are again strongly encouraged to use the Safe Trek uh, TIMS ATP tool to generate the maps and the data. Uh, and uh, as with the small infrastructure projects, uh, medium infrastructure applications are asked to uh, demonstrate how the proposed countermeasures in the project directly address the underlying factors that contribute to uh, pedestrian and bicycle collisions in the area. Uh, in other words, um, this section of the application is really asking you to analyze the collision data that you provide and to explain how the proposed project features best address the safety issues or needs that are surfaced in the data analysis. Uh, moving on to, oh, sorry, I will slow down. Sorry about that. Uh, moving on to uh, public participation. So uh, with public participation, uh, similar to the small infrastructure uh, projects, uh, the medium infrastructure applications are asked to describe the, uh, to describe the community-based public participation process that uh, identified or developed uh, the proposed project. Now, uh, in addition to that, uh, medium infrastructure uh, applications in particular are asked to describe uh, the type of feedback that they receive during their public participation process and to explain what alternatives were considered in the proposal development. So that's the kind of the key uh, differentiation between the small and medium infrastructure applications with regard to the public participation and planning question. Uh, now, the, the next question for the medium infrastructure um, application is a completely uh, brand new uh, section, uh, and this is uh, present in both the medium and large infrastructure applications. So it's a question around con uh, context-sensitive bikeways and walkways and innovative project elements. So um, for the context-sensitive question, applicants are uh, asked to explain how the project utilizes the uh, recognized best solutions for the local context. So uh, another way to think about that is um, really ask yourself, is the facility uh, being proposed um, appropriate after you analyze um, the, the local context for traffic volumes, speeds, a level of stress, land uses, etc.? cetera? Um, so for example, is, is throwing down a, a minimum width bike lane on a 50 mile per hour street really context sensitive? Um, and and I, I would argue that that is not context sensitive. And so uh, you will be um, evaluated on, on how well you're um, proposing a particular uh, project feature that matches the local context. Uh, I should also add that this uh, question includes some language around uh, level of stress. And so I'll just read it out to you guys. Um, if the stress level uh, on uh, a facility is medium or high, is the project going beyond minimum design standards to maximize potential users of all ages and abilities? So again, um, when you are uh, crafting your uh, particular project, really uh, do that uh, in-depth analysis of what's going on there out in the street. You know, don't rely on uh, Google uh, Street View to uh, assess a, a, a particular um, uh, uh, feature for an application. Actually go out there uh, and experience the conditions on the ground uh, to really help inform the type of facility that you're proposing. Uh, the second component of this question uh, relates to innovative project elements. And so applicants are uh, asked uh, to share whether the project proposes uh, any solutions that are new to the applicant's region uh, or, or um, whether in innovative project elements were considered uh, but not selected and if, if they were not selected to explain why. Uh, the next section, which is applicable to both uh, medium and large infrastructure applications, is uh, leveraging funds. So uh, th this is um, pretty similar to past cycles where you earn uh, points on a sliding scale. You basically earn uh, one point for every 5% of uh, uh, leverage funding that you can bring uh, to the table to support the project. Uh, one thing to note here is that uh, in-kind funding for staffing does not qualify as leverage funds. And uh, in the applications themselves, um, uh, Caltrans uh, recommends that you uh, contact them if you have any questions around uh, what, what qualifies as leveraged funds. Uh, 
Uh, and then uh, the last component is around uh, the scope plan consistency. So that's a, a similar uh, question across um, all of the infrastructure applications. Um, one thing I wanted to note, since we did get a question around the California Conservation Corps um, uh, and, and why there's a, a penalty for it. So uh, within the Active Transportation Program's um, uh, enabling statute, there, there is language in there uh, around partnering with the Corps. And so um, all applicants uh, in previous cycles and in this one are uh, going to be asked to at least uh, submit their uh, project application to the Corps for um, uh, evaluation of whether or not the Corps can um, partner on that particular uh, project application application. And so you will only uh, receive that penalty if you did not uh, initiate that conversation. And, and I believe the core has set up um, a process in the last cycle that they're continuing to refine in this cycle. And we can work to get more information about uh, what that process looks like for this cycle in particular. Now, uh, finishing out with the large infrastructure applications. So uh, again, uh, the uh, disadvantaged communities uh, kicks off the application. Uh, the requirements for this question are the same uh, for large infrastructure as with medium infrastructure, uh, with the exception that there, there is a much stronger expectation that you'll be, uh, that applicants will provide uh, documentation to demonstrate how the proposed project was uh, uh, supported by or requested by disadvantaged community residents. Now, uh, the statement of need, again, uh, pretty similar to the medium infrastructure application uh, with the exception that there, um, I, I believe there will be a greater expectation for uh, applicants to clearly discuss how the proposed project best addresses uh, the need that is uh, outlined in this uh, section by the applicant. Uh, for safety, uh, again, same uh, questions and requirements as the medium infrastructure, but there will be a, a greater expectation that applicants will demonstrate how the proposed countermeasures in the project directly address those uh, underlying factors that contribute to the uh, pedestrian and bicycle collisions in the area. Uh, for public participation, uh, again, uh, pretty much the same questions as the medium infrastructure application covering, uh, again, the community-based um, um, process uh, in developing the application, describing who was engaged, how they were engaged, and to summarize their feedback. Uh, the, the key difference between medium and large is that large infrastructure uh, applications will be evaluated for uh, whether or not the proposed project is listed in an approved uh, transportation plan. And, and that question is going to be worth one one point. Um, then the, the next section is the context sensitive bikeways and walkways and the innovative project elements. And uh, that question is exactly the same for medium infrastructure and large infrastructure projects. Now, um, getting to a, a brand new question. Um, so as uh, Linda mentioned in the um, guidelines changes discussion, there, there um, is now a, a new question around transformative projects, and this applies uh, only to large uh, infrastructure projects. And so uh, this question is rather open-ended at the moment. There may be some refinements that happen between now and the uh, opening of the call for projects, but uh, for now, the applicant is uh, basically asked uh, to describe the transformative nature of their infrastructure uh, project, and they are asked how the project will transform the non-motorized environment. Uh, and lastly, they are asked to discuss how other new or proposed um, uh, projects or policies in the vicinity of the proposed project amplify the transformative nature of the proposed project. So in, uh, another way to think about it is you can ask yourself, is the proposed project part of a whole suite of projects that will help to transform a neighborhood or a community's uh, walking and biking conditions? Uh, then uh, the next uh, part of the large infrastructure application is around cost effectiveness. So uh, this is a question that uh, has existed in the past 
for this cycle, uh, this question will only apply to large infrastructure projects. And um, it, it really boils down. Uh, so with this question, um, you're not being asked to use a cost benefit analysis um, or anything like that, um, although you're not precluded from doing so. Um, uh, but I think for the California Transportation Commission, it really boils down to uh, uh, one simple question, which is, um, why the proposed project is the best use of state resources. I think that is the, the key question that the uh, commission is trying to evaluate with cost effectiveness. Uh, then for leveraging funds and for the scope plan consistency, those questions are the same as the medium infrastructure applications. So um, I know we went through that all very, very quick um, we just had to do that just for time. And uh, at the end of uh, this webinar, we'll go over uh, a, a number of different resources that will be going over a lot of this in much more depth than we'll be going uh, over today. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Linda to go over uh, some lessons learned that might be, uh, from previous cycles that might help you as you're uh, gearing up for cycle four. Thanks, Tony. So yeah. Definitely what we've seen, and just generally before diving into what we have here on the screen, uh, the demand for the money available has continued to outpace what is available. So we're really seeing a lot of communities want to bring these dollars to their local area, but uh, you know, not as much, even though there's been an influx of funding, uh, you know, we're, we're still expecting the demand to be high this year. Uh, so in the past, it's been very competitive and we still expect that. With that said, uh, you know, bringing better projects and hopefully this, the streamlining of these applications uh, will see a lot of great projects being funded this year. So um, a strong trend has been towards both applications that are encompass encompassing both walking and biking. And so, you know, you wanna look at that, that together and then uh you know going into some of these these points here you really want to tailor your application and your project to really demonstrate that you're meeting the goals of the atp program uh you know are you increasing biking and walking are you uh, addressing public health are you looking at how to get people out of their cars and and reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, there's definitely in the guidelines a way that you can see if your project is lining up with those goals. Another important uh, you know, lesson and, and things that we want to see demonstrated in applications is that are you uh, engaging in different sectors? Are you um, engaging different stakeholders? Who are you really reaching with this project and, and, and its development? Uh, and uh, you know, the some, you know, the purpose of, for example, the, the public health component is that are you really engaging with uh, public health um, in, a, in a meaningful way to really address the issues through your, your projects? And so, uh, you know, are you consulting with your local bike or walk coalition? Uh, are, are people seeing this project and are they involved with it? So really great applications demonstrate that they were able to do that. And so uh, the other thing is that data, you know, is it, you're really going to get further when you're able to demonstrate uh, your project is um, using meaningful, legitimate uh, data, and it's based on the target community, and you're presenting it clearly and understandably. Uh, and so we're really looking for that as well. Other lessons, you know, moving um, moving into some just just tips tips for success, uh, you know, you really want to read instructions, guidelines, and the scoring rubrics, care, scoring rubrics carefully. Uh, some of the, the best applicant, applicants and those that often are shown in, in success stories, they, they say time and again, we read everything uh, clear, uh, carefully, we followed the instructions, and we used the rubric. And the scoring rubric is not available now, but will be by the by the time of the call of the applications and uh, the call for projects. And so really take a look and, and line up, you know, your your narratives, your your uh, your application with with where the points are going to be given most. And you want to focus your efforts, you know, on the largest parts of the, the points, 
but don't neglect any question. You know, every point counts here. Uh, and learn from the winners. Like I mentioned, there's three cycles now worth of high scoring projects. And, you know, you can um, take a look at those. Some of those are, you know, listed on the website, uh, on the, C the CTC website, uh, or, you know, it, perhaps you are one of those uh, recipients and uh, could, could be giving pointers to others too. So we hope to engage with you as well. Lastly, uh, Think about incorporating standards of tomorrow in your designs and in your in your program. Uh, we really want to start moving away with just just doing the the things that we were doing in the past in terms of design and and knowing that that doesn't necessarily create the change we want to see in our communities. So, are are you looking at the latest design standards? Uh, you know, are are you having the conversation with with your walk and bike advocates at the local level and your public health department? Um, where can you turn to, uh, and certainly you can turn to CalBike and CalWalk for, for these questions, but are, are you really going to make this a robust, robust uh, application? And lastly, um, Tony has some resources to go over to mention here for you. Well, I don't hear Tony. Sorry, I was on mute. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are going to be a lot of different resources that, that are coming, uh, that are already available or that will be coming online shortly for folks uh, to help you prepare your applications for uh, ATP Cycle 4. Uh, so the first one I wanted to mention is the Caltrans Active Transportation Resource Center. The, the website is right there. Uh, they are, uh, preparing a, a series of what they're calling flash training webinars. So these webinars will be um, covering some of the, the new tools and requirements, including the uh, UC Berkeley SafeTrek TIMS uh, tool. They'll be kind of walking through um, exactly how you use that tool. I believe they'll be uh, walking through the non-infrastructure application uh, and uh, the planning applications as well. Um, I also know that the uh, California Department uh, of Public Health staff at the ATRC are also available to answer questions around um, program development, implementation, and evaluation for non-infrastructure applications. So I uh, highly encourage you to uh, reach out to them. Uh, they are, uh, the non-infrastructure wing, the, the public health folks are referred to as the Active Transportation Safety Program, uh, and you can reach them at uh, ATSP at CDPH ca.gov. Uh, and they also have a, a wealth of resources and case studies um, from different communities uh, across California making uh, different non-infrastructure uh, programs work. Um, the, the second resource I wanted to highlight is the uh, Active Transportation Resource Team. So that is CalBike, CalWalks, uh, Rails to Trails, and Local Government Commission. Uh, we will be uh, hosting uh, uh, a couple of in-person uh, workshops in Riverside and Tulare counties uh, between April 2nd and April 5th. And we're also um, offering uh, in-person uh, one-on-one -on -one consultations uh, to help you uh, through your project development. So if you're interested in that, uh, please contact Barry Bergman. His email is right there. Uh, and there is a, a short form to fill out uh, if you are interested in accessing that assistance. Uh, the next, um, opportunity or resource is uh, a newly funded uh, pilot program from the Strategic Growth Council. So uh, it's called the Pilot uh, CCI ATP Technical Assistance Program. Uh, and this program uh, involves uh, the same team members. So uh, it's being led by local government commission and involves uh, Rails to Trails, CalBike, uh, and CalWalks. Uh, and uh, the goal of this program is to provide some really in-depth technical assistance for um, three to five disadvantaged communities across the state. Uh, if you're interested uh, in accessing that technical assistance, you must fill out a survey. So I've put the link here and the surveys are due April 6th. 
Uh, the last uh, resource I wanted to highlight is uh, CalWalks uh, is able to provide one-on-one -on -one, uh, application assistance uh, for disadvantaged community applicants. And we have a focus for communities located in the Central Valley, uh, the North State, North Coast, or San Bernardino County. So uh, we will be releasing a, a public uh, kind of uh, application uh, in the coming weeks. But for now, if you are interested, please contact um, Esther Postiglione, who is our state policy manager at, at the email on the screen. Uh, I think with that, Linda, we will move on to questions, but um, I think I'll just leave up the resources page um, so folks can uh, grab what they need. Sure, or thanks. Not. Or there you go. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, let's get started. Should we just go through this? Um, we have one question here. Going back to the what can be qualified as a or used to identify a disadvantaged community, there's a question about if the healthy health disadvantage index can be used. So the answer is no, and also the health disadvantage index is now the healthy places index. Uh, and the Healthy Places Index can be used to help you identify uh, the local public health data that you can use or you would need to demonstrate in your statement of need. So it's definitely one of the tools to use to, to get that information, but it won't be uh, a way to uh, qualify for disadvantaged communities. Uh, so we have another question here. Um, does teaming with a local community-based organization help the chances of a local government agency? Um, so I would say that there's nothing um, in the application in and of itself um, that would um, that would you know be reward be rewarding uh, an agency for working with a local community-based organization. However, I will say that um, you know public participation, as you as you've seen um, us run through all the application types, public participation is a very big component of all of the applications. And so uh, we strongly encourage local government agencies to work with um, community-based organizations to really uh, beef up the public participation um, component of their application. Uh, and in particular, if you uh, as an agency uh, completed, you know, a public participation process many, many years ago for a project that you're finally proposing to the ATP, um, I would strongly encourage you to look to your nonprofit and community-based organization um, uh, partners now to basically uh, initiate, you know, a smaller follow-up round of informal public participation just to um, make sure that your public participation is, uh, is fresh and relatively recent and still resonates with the community that you're trying to serve. Great. So let's see, let's go to um, any idea how long it will take CTC to review regional disadvantaged community definition. If someone submits it now, will they likely be heard before cycle begins and they know that the project can be submitted? So Tony, you want to take this one? Yeah, I am not sure how long it will take. Um, I think that is going to be up to uh, Lori at CTC, and I know that she has committed to involving um, members of the Active Transportation Program Technical Advisory Committee to help review those definitions. Um, so um, I don't have an answer. We can um, circle back with Lori to kind of get a better sense. Um, but my my personal sense is they probably won't know um, by the application deadline. But that is just my personal thoughts on the issue right now. But we will uh, circle back with uh, CTC just to uh, get a clear answer on um, when they expect um, those decisions to be finalized. Okay, we have another question here. Uh, for plans, are disadvantaged communities limited to those identified by SB 535, uh, so the top 25% of DAC statewide, or AB 1550? Uh, and the answer is no. Uh, for the active transportation program, uh, like I mentioned, there's a menu of options uh, to qualify as disadvantaged communities, and some of those overlap with uh, the definitions that were posed in the 
uh, question, uh, but there are more than uh, those. So I'll just run through them uh, again so that everybody uh, can uh, remember them. So the first one is uh, income. So uh, less than or um, less than or equal to 80% of the statewide median household income. There's the Cal and Virus screen definition. So if uh, a community is within the top 25% of Cal and Virus screen, there is um, the, uh, for Safe for Us to School pro uh, projects, you can use the free reduced meal program participation rates. And so to qualify there, you have to have a participation rate of 75% or higher. Um, if you're a federally recognized uh, tribe, you qualify as a disadvantaged community for this program. Uh, for smaller communities that feel like they, uh, the official data sources don't reflect uh, their income levels, you may submit a quantitative assessment that documents um, the income levels of that particular community. Uh, and then lastly, uh, regional definitions may be considered. Um, regional definitions have to be uh, adopted uh, in a regional transportation plan. Uh, they have to meet uh, you know, federal Title VI uh, requirements, and they had to have gone through a robust public participation process. And again, regional definitions must be submitted to the CTC for review and approval by June 1st. And actually, we have um, Emily Abrams, thanks for adding that the determination of eligibility will be by June 29th. It's, it is in the, the, uh, the guidelines now that okay. uh, the regional definition will be determined by June 29th. So, um, you know, it is during the application period, but it's uh, before you have to submit. Okay, we have a question around, uh, with HSIP funding included in HCP, will cities be precluded from applying to the HSIP call for projects that has been funded by HCP? So um, I should uh, put a footnote. So um, the funding sources for the HCP in the guidelines state uh, HSIP, so Highway Safety Improvement Program funds or other federal funds. And uh, with the fund estimate that the CTC just released a few days ago, um, that has clearly that has said explicitly that this cycle of funding will not be including any highway safety improvement program funding. So the state will be using other federal funds um, uh, in this cycle of ATP. Okay, we have another question. Uh, do ATP reviewers like to see actual bike ped counts or count estimates? Tony, you have some thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, as a reviewer, I think it's really important to provide counts because you need to establish a baseline. Otherwise, how are you going to measure your project success? And regardless of what the reviewers think, uh, uh, the program uh, is statutorily required to collect this information. So uh, even though you're not being scored on providing counts and documenting your methodology, it's a, it's a baseline uh, screening requirement. So please uh, don't. Um, don't ignore that section of the application. <laughs> okay, we have some questions just clarifying some of the, the public health aspects. So public health is added to the need statement, the statement of need. Will applicants still be required to partner with local public health departments? And also, what do you see as the role of local public health departments? So uh, as far as if the applicants have to, are still required as far as points, the way that the, 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 the public health question has been laid out in the applications now is to, you're basically describing the health disparity or the conditions. Uh, and in order to do that, I mean, perhaps you, you don't need to go to your public health department, but part of the rubrics, I imagine, what we have submitted, uh, and so this hasn't been um, finalized, but the, the breakdown of those points will be asking, was the local public health department uh, engaged? And so uh, it's 
you'll see in the rubrics that you, you do want to demonstrate that there has been engagement. Let's see, we, we have a question here. Um, for ATP projects that were submitted previously and not funded, can the applicant get feedback from CTC or Caltrans on how they uh, were scored and how to improve? Uh, and the answer to that is yes. Um, if you were the project sponsor or the applicant, uh, you may uh, request from uh, CTC um, all of the evaluation documents. So um, during the evaluation process, the reviewers actually are required to uh, document how they scored you and to provide feedback. Um, I will say that the feedback has been kind of spotty depending on the reviewer team. So even if you kind of get those review sheets back, um, they may not have the information you're looking for. Uh, but I know that Lori in the past has said that she is more than happy to talk to any project applicant who wants to um, understand how they did in past rounds and to, and to get some advice. Great. So. One question is, can you clarify how safe routes projects under infrastructure are different from education, encouragement, and evaluation, et cetera, programs? Couldn't safe routes apply under both project categories? And the answer is yes. Uh, there, in the rubrics, again, uh, in the infrastructure pieces, you, you, uh, you, you would get extra points uh, if your infrastructure, is, uh, your infrastructure project is benefiting students. Um, and then as far as a, the non-infrastructure or a plan, a safe routes plan, then those would be separate applications. Yeah, and I, th I think there, um, and it was probably oversight for me not putting it uh, under the non-infrastructure piece, but um, one thing we wanna highlight with the non-infrastructure uh, component of this program is that it's not just limited to safe routes to school um, uh, education and encouragement programs. Um, you can uh, reach other populations as well. So you can do senior focused safe routes for seniors programs. You can do community wide education or encouragement programs and the like. Okay, we have a question here around uh, the TIMS calculator. Uh, is the TIMS calculator going to be used for the BC ratio or is there a different calculation? So um, th uh, the TIMS calculator is a tool um, that's used mostly for the highway safety improvement program. Uh, this tool is not gonna be used for the active transportation program. So uh, when you go to tims.berkeley.edu to access their tools, they'll have different tools. And for ATP, there is a, a standalone ATP uh, map viewer tool. Uh, and uh, that is the tool that you'll be using to um, collect and present the safety collision information and there's no uh, cost benefit calculation that's uh, included in that. Um, and when we went through the uh, different application types, uh, none of the application types require you to conduct any sort of cost benefit analysis. Uh, for large infrastructure applications, there are there is a question around cost effectiveness. Uh, you are allowed to, to use a cost benefit analysis or ratio of your choosing, but you're not required to. Uh, and again, with, with that cost effectiveness question, you're really trying to answer why your proposed project is the best use of state resources. Okay. Great, so related to bike and ped count question, can you clarify when automated counters are eligible within the ATP? Uh, so I think that's uh, definitely a Caltrans uh, question for the final definitive answer, but uh, my recollection in past workshops is that Caltrans has said that they are eligible uh, expenses. And I know Emily is on the line, so if Emily, you have an answer, if you have a definitive answer, you can let me know. I think that's that's what I also remember as well. So um, we'll wait to hear if there's anything different than that. So it looks like we have a question around, you know, what would a pu perfect public participation score entail? Um, so I think that with public participation, um, you just want to really make sure that you are meaningfully engaging the population that the project is trying to serve. Um, so if you are, um, 
So, so you know, making sure that um, the project area residents uh, are able to attend different meetings. So, making sure that your uh, meetings or public participation opportunities are at convenient times, are at convenient locations. If you're trying to serve populations that include folks who uh, are um, non-English speaking, making sure that you provide uh, translation and, and interpretation services, uh, making sure that you provide child care so that parent working parents can participate uh, and things like that. I don't know, Linda, if you had anything to add on public participation. Yeah, I mean, again, we don't have the, the updated rubrics, but from what I remember, some of the best applications, they demonstrated public participation through showing uh, sign-in sheets, um, you know, showing the number of, of workshops they had, uh, showing um, certainly uh, letters of support was was one but uh, that, I think what we're what they're looking for is just you know are you going are you going to the public are you asking the public to come to you are you engaging with those in your community that uh, you know want to see these projects happen one thing that happened for example is that uh, an ATP project was awarded in the augmentation this last year. And then I remember some of the, the at bike advocates saying, well, you know, maybe that that actually wasn't the best project for that particular area. So that made me think that maybe your some of the applicants are, are not engaging with those that are, you know, deeply engaged with um, the bike or, or walk community. And so are you reaching, um, are you reaching teachers? Are you reaching students? You know, if you're doing a safe routes program, you know your constituency are the students themselves. So how are you demonstrating that um, you know they're they're um, they have buy-in as well? And and I guess uh, another way that um, I've been thinking about this is I can I think it's very easy to see what bad public participation looks like. So I can give you some examples from applications I've reviewed. So uh, some applicants I've seen um, consider their public participation process simply posting a city council meeting notice, and that's it. Like literally, that's it. So they didn't they didn't really try. Or um, you know, it's one Facebook post or something. So uh, I think like for evaluators, evaluators and reviewers can can very easily tell when an applicant has not even tried to uh, engage uh, you know the public that they're trying to serve. And then um, going back to the automated counters piece, we did get an answer from Emily at Caltrans. Uh, yes, uh, automated counters are allow allowable expenses under ATP. However, they must be a part of a larger project. So you can't just uh, apply uh, uh, just for automated counters as a project. One question is, which grant application type should we use for safe routes to school? Would it be plan or infrastructure? So depends. If it's a safe routes to school plan, then you'd want to use the, the plan application. Uh, and again, that's uh, a, the application that's specifically geared towards disadvantaged communities. You want to make sure that you, you do qualify under that. and. Uh, if it's infrastructure, you know, the components of Safe Routes to School can, can fall into the, the infrastructure. So it depends if it's a plan or if it's components of a Safe, safe Routes to School plan. And uh, I'm just going to unmute Victoria. Hey, Victoria, do you want to just share what you chatted to me? <laughs> Sure. Sorry. I, I was typing and, and um, I'll see if I can actually read my own notes because I'm not good talking like off the cusp like you are, Tony. Um, so I was just going to say uh, to the point before about um, what do you see the role of local public health? Um, and I just so I'm Victoria Custodio from the Active Transportation Resource Center. I'm here also at the California Department of Public Health um, working on chronic disease prevention and injury control. Um, as well as health equity and some of the priorities of our department. Um, and I wanted just to reiterate that we know that local health departments have been providing a lot of leadership around active transportation for some time now. Um, definitely in the realm of community engagement, a lot of local health departments have um, other uh, public health programs that function at the community level. They are aware of kind of the um, 
the relationships um, and um, partners and people at different institutions that are kind of the go-getters who can kind of really make the work happen, get um, the public out to meetings. Um, you can also op op um, sometimes piggyback on existing um, you know, community meetings that are happening around other health issues. Um, Local health departments have been essential at merging transportation planning discussions with local health priorities and initiatives. Again, um, um, I mentioned chronic disease, injury prevention, climate health, um, and they've also kind of been able to tie in to the transportation discussions into their local he uh, community health assessments. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to um, say that you know local health departments um, all over are, are essential at highlighting health disparities. Um, again, so recognizing the communities that are most in need um, uh, through, you know, that, that are it's indicated through data so they can help with those data components. Um, so if you haven't already um, enlisted your pub local public health um, partners in your uh, project or application planning, um, what you can do is reach out to the ATRC using our, um, our general um, email atsp at cdph.ca.gov. And um, what we can do is try to connect you to the right person at your local health department um, to try to get them involved with your efforts. Um, we know that there's, um, you know, there's always priorities with public health efforts um, happening, but um, this is a great time to kind of um, reach out to us so that we can help you um, extend, your, uh, extend your partnerships around your active transportation planning. Thanks, Tony. Oh, thanks, Victoria. <laughs> Thank you, Victoria. Uh, so we have a question here. Do you have a dollar amount in the guidelines for plan or non-infrastructure? Uh, there is a minimum request for funds. And so that minimum is $250,000. And uh, it doesn't apply to non-infrastructure infrastructure projects, uh, safe routes to school projects, recreational trails, and plants. So no, there is, there's not a minimum or a maximum, I guess for uh, plants and non-infrastructure. But I, I think our, our recommendation is, you know, make sure that your funding request is commensurate with the types of activities that you are proposing. And uh, like Victoria said, uh, CDPH is available uh, to help with non-infrastructure, um, you know, program development and scoping. So um, definitely reach out to um, those folks. If you write an ATP grant for a project, are you still later able to bid on it and work on it later if it gets funding? Uh, I'm not quite sure I understand. Tony? Are you, uh, is this person from a nonprofit or something like that? I'm not sure. It's Jonathan Delgado. Should we let him? Let's, let's see if we can. Jonathan. We're going to unmute you, Jonathan, so you can ask your question. Uh, unmute. ATP Jonathan. Grant? Yes, hello. Hi, you asked a question and Hi. I understand it. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, sorry. So we are writing an ATP grant for a agency, and we are wondering if this grant gets funding, would, be, would we be prohibited from bidding on this project and doing design work for it? Is it a conflict of interest if we write the grant for it and then later we are trying to do designs for it? That's a great question. I don't think so this I, is... Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm not sure I have an answer for that. Um, we can definitely circle back with Caltrans, um, but um, regardless of who writes the application, um, it still has to go through a competitive bid process. So um, yeah, we can we can check in with Caltrans to see if that uh, is a conflict of interest or not. So you, Tony, you had talked about uh, this first one, right? Does teaming with a local CBO help chances of local government agency? Did we go over that earlier? Yeah, I think we went over yeah. that. Okay. So here's another question. If your city does not have a disadvantaged community, is it worth the effort to apply, losing 10 points? Wow, we, we would need a whole other webinar for this one, wouldn't we? <laughs> uh, I highly encourage you to, to think about, one, you know, 
if if you're looking after the if you're looking for those ten points, then maybe you would want to see where in your community uh, you would be able to fall under one of the disadvantaged communities um, definitions. Uh, I, I I can't imagine that every community that, that there there's a community out there that doesn't have uh, a you know that and and maybe it is the case and if it is the case I still encourage you to apply because especially in the infrastructure it is just ten points uh, there's a lot of ways to demonstrate need and there's a lot of ways to demonstrate that you know uh, you want to bring ATP dollars to your community uh, I imagine if you speak with your local uh, walk and bike advocates they would show you some projects uh, that would be worthy of these points and so. Uh, or worthy of the, the projects or in the funding. So I, I wouldn't be discouraged by the disadvantaged community piece that that effort is there to uh, really put uh, an emphasis on where we have historically not invested in communities. However, uh, I would encourage you to still uh, look for projects and engage with your community. And, and it might be that, uh, you know, when you're speaking with your local health department, there's a way to address a local concern through uh, a really great application, uh, project application. So uh, it's a it's a bit of a process, but uh, please reach out to us if this is still um, an issue for you. All right, so we're coming around to the end of our webinar here. Uh, and let's see. Okay, just in relation to the, just the question I just answered, uh, we have, um, thanks Marvin for chiming in. I would point out that even if an agency might not be competitive at the state level due to lack of disadvantaged community, they would probably still be able to get funding through the MPO level. Very great point. Uh, you know, you, uh, you would want to see if that's available for you as well. All right, thanks everyone for attending. That's uh, the end of our questions here and I hope this was useful. Uh, please continue to reach out to us and uh, you know, we'll continue to be able to provide um, support and check out our websites and check out the links that we've, we've sent. We'll be sending around the, the recording and the slides uh, and please uh, check your emails for that. Thanks and uh, have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Bye.